when you click that thing, it crashed. You know, you're back now. That's weird. It crashed when you click the earthquake map to uh, put it on the seven day. Okay. That is where it crashed. Like as soon as you click the button, just. Well, uh, I'm still showing that I'm streaming. Oh, on my well, end. Let's... Just so you know. Let's just Not sure what's happening going. live there, but um, it looks like I'm still transmitting. Yeah, it, yeah, it's back on now. All right, so it looks so, like we're back. All right, we're back, and I, well, I guess what happened was I clicked the U the USGS earthquake page there, and it caused a lag spike. So I have to avoid doing that there in the future. But um, what you can see there uh, is basically that the here we go back a slide, I guess. Here is Earthquakes for the last month, and what I'm doing now is taking the USGS site and using their cross-section tool here. So I've drawn two points, point A and point B, and we're looking at a slice through the island here and looking at the relative depth of these events here. So looking at that to start here, here's our Kilauea Earthquakes that are these shallow ones near the top of the screen, and the deeper ones are the Pahala ones over here. So in map view, the distance between these earthquakes isn't that, isn't that great. If looking from above, it'll only be that far. But you can see vertically that there's quite a bit of depth between these two clusters of events. So they're actually further apart vertically with depth than they are on a map laterally. And so that's one thing that why we often discount the pilot earthquakes, and you know, we can kind of see that there's not any real connection there. It's thought that there might be connection. If there is one, that it might be from Pahala possibly going this way and then coming upwards. So there are a cluster of earthquakes directly beneath Kilauea Summit right through here that might be part of that vertical feeder from, from depth up into the volcano that way. In any case, it's a long way uh, coming up from these events, and so we're going to look past these and focus now on a cluster that's closer to the, to the surface right by Kilauea Summit there. And starting off here, uh, we have cross-sections um, from the northwest, uh, just off the side of Mauna Loa's Summit Caldera, all the way to Kilauea south flank here. Right, and we're going to look across this segment of earthquakes from the last month. And doing that, uh, we still see those deep events way down here at the root of Kilauea. We actually see the cluster that's right under the summit is this bunch right in here, pretty tightly clustered together. And you see more dispersed earthquakes further over. This is Mauna Loa's south flank, a little bit more dispersed, and Kilauea's south flank, a little bit more dispersed, right? So. What's happening is as the stuff in the middle is getting injected with magma, it's pushing out to the sides there and there, and it's causing the south flank to move the most, especially. And against Mauna Loa, it's causing the, the area to get pushed and squeezed between Kilauea and Mauna Loa. And it does try to adjust, and there are earthquakes over there. And that is, in fact, why we have more action on the northwest part than we do in the southeast, what we come to here next. Um, but to first filter out those deeper events so we can get a little, bit of, a little better resolution vertically. So that's what I've done is just that same cross-section across from Mauna Loa down to South Flank, but filtering out the deep earthquakes. So looking at the shallow part there, now you can see there's that summit cluster. It's kind of stretched out vertically. And then this is all Mauna Loa's South Flank and Kilauea's South Flank over here. Right? What you might notice is that there's actually two different Clusters here is like this one blob that's over here, slightly over um, Mormakai towards the ocean, and shallower. And the one that's closer to Mauna Loa is a little bit deeper over there. So let's zoom in and take out all stuff from the side and zoom into this middle part here next and see what we can resolve in that. So once again, um, northwest to southeast, A to B, but just a summit. And doing that, we can jump in here and see. There is those two clusters. This is the best visualization we've had so far, right? So this is that Namakani Payo campground area cluster. That's a little bit closer to A. And a Kilauea Summit, a little bit closer to B over here is this cloud right in here. All right, so this is actually very reminiscent to what we saw at Mauna Loa when it was building towards eruption. All right, you usually don't have earthquakes within the magma itself because the magma is a liquid. You can't break a liquid to cause an earthquake. 
So the earthquakes have to happen in a solid surrounding the liquid, right? So you can kind of see that the edges of where there's earthquakes might be the edges of these areas. So certainly up in here, right above, uh, right below the caldera is a zone of most intense shallow earthquakes. There certainly could be fingers or a web of magma injecting into there as well, right? Um, but it does appear like the big void here is kind of right in there-ish, right? That's the zone that if you were to guess where, where there's a magma chamber, you'd guess it's somewhere in there-ish, right? Because uh, maybe there's some pathway coming in, some area where it's building a pressure, it's pushing upwards, bulging, causing the ground to tilt away. It's trying to push towards Mauna Loa, but Mauna Loa is steady like a big doorstop over there, so it's actually causing this zone of earthquakes at the campground zone, not like Kanipayo. And the south flank does move, and that's why we see the GPS and all that stuff going the other direction, and there's kind of asymmetry here. right? But this is a very similar situation as we saw before, before Mauna Loa erupted back in the end of last year, and here we are, very similar pattern for Kilauea. Day. A couple other things we can look at. So we've looked at it cutting across northwest to southeast. What about within that shallower magma body now? Let's look along the length of it across the caldera the long way. Right? So we're now we're ex excluding the, the campground stuff because we know that that's off to the side a little bit. Let's look just at where the magma, right, right, right the magma uh, is building below this area right here. So that cross section looks like this. So we maybe can't see the A's and B's here at the bottom. And there's A at the left and B at the right. That's been the entire time here. So this is southwest, this is northeast. And what you can see is that there is definitely like a little envelope right here, right? I'm going to draw out something like that. Where the shallowest part of this envelope is actually close to the caldera itself. Right? There does seem to be an extension to the southwest. But that extension actually seems to start off deeper and come shallower. So there might be some pathway that's further, that's actually rising towards the caldera from the southwest, which might, might, might see those earthquakes activating over there. And you can see that uh, the, the yellows are the, the ones that are two weeks old or so, and the oranges are the two days old or so. That activity we had last week actually came a little bit shallower and was more widespread than the oranges that we're seeing here in the last two days, not today. So that's, that's interesting to note. Um, pull it back one more time. Right, this this spot of the highest highest uh, earthquakes in the depth range is right in the middle, of right in there. So there's one more thing we can look at on this scale, and now we're gonna for the first time look at uh, time versus depth here. And so uh, these are just colored by time. And now we're curious if they're getting shallower in any way whatsoever. So here is that last two weeks in the yellow. And you can see the, the shallowest earthquakes popping in just under two weeks ago there, right? And, and not in any clear ascending pattern, but like a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit there, which is why we probably haven't heard any real escalation of any alert levels. Um, it's more when you see a, a line that spans vertically going up all the way that you imagine that something is propagating its way upwards. So it's interesting to note that here, the event in the last couple of days has a little bit of that going on. It's not continuous, though, right? You see that a couple of days ago, it started to come up, but it actually had it in three different clusters, one there, one there, and one here. The shallow cluster has continued for the last couple of days, and today it's activating, but it's a little bit deeper than it was a couple of days ago. So it's very slight details um, of the earthquake patterns here. The big picture is, of course, the whole thing is quaking because it's pressurized and it wants to burst out. But if we can analyze a little clues of where the earthquakes and how, maybe we can get more insight um, as we prepare for next year. All right, so a couple, couple more of these. Um, what I thought I'd do is filter out just to the last couple of days. And here we are, northwest to southeast again, the last couple of days to get a look at that. And here they are. That same overall pattern, right? That kind of triangle shaped. And so still shallowest under the caldera region. The red ones are the ones within the last couple hours. Uh, this was when I did it earlier today, so call it just earlier today. Those ones are happening in deeper and within that cloud right through here, right? It's definitely not coming towards the surface. This is just the, the cut once again. But as we just did, as we, just did we could uh, analyze it with the time. But first, let's look the other direction. Same data, but long ways. There it is again, um, right in the middle at depth. So yeah, just kind of clarify and come back to 
come back to this one. This one's the northwest to southeast, right? So that's that's the campground area, just a little bit of the campground, and then mostly within a summit area right through here. And this one southwest showing the most recent earthquake, just directly beneath the summit right there. And the last one, time and depth. So it'll last a couple of days, time depth and no clear patterns. You see that that was a little a little cluster right there that seemed like it might be something trying to move maybe there but it's really not that convincing overall so here we are here we stand we're still waiting for the next pop and you can see it's it's initiating these these sequences but none of them is actually taking it all the way to the surface so we'll see at what point something like that does initiate if it comes to the surface what it takes we'll just keep waiting and watching so to finish off the earthquakes here i thought i'd just play you guys uh, animation. Um, this is from the Iris Earthquake browser that I've clipped here um, and a loop for you guys. So here is on the right, these are earthquakes per day. So you can see a little bit of a histogram right there as well. This was two weeks ago. This was the last couple of days. We're not obviously showing the whole last month here. Right? So um, i to zoom it into that just to show you how, how that's developing over time. Let's get it scaled right here. Probably good right there. So a little bit all over. You see some clusters right in the middle here. There does seem to be a flare up at this campground area to the northwest over there. That happens two weeks ago. So that, that's off to the side really. The one happening in the last couple of days is more directly underneath the summit over here, which is which is why it seems another step closer. And how many steps are left, that's the thing we can't really gauge yet is how much Kind of push and still make space before popping up. So that's the earthquake cycle for the last month in a histogram, and that'll wrap up our earthquakes coverage. A little in depth dive today, um, since that's most of what we're seeing on a volcano today. All right, so let's turn to our hazards, which, since there is no lava coming out of the ground, is just the gases. And here are here is a volcanic kind of map volcanic mapping uh, vog mapping project vmap uh, showing the vog forecast for the next couple of days here on hawaii island so the emission values are pretty low this is only one point source so you see it does produce occasional clouds that drift around a volcano area and possibly to the southwest up of pahala and nalehu and i see a little bit coming in ocean view as well down in here so not as intense as it could could get, or or as it will get when it erupts again, but uh, definitely still flying through there, as you can see from the forecast. Next couple days here. However, at present, everything is pretty calm, pretty clear. So, looking at Purple Air Citizen Science Monitoring Network here, everything is in the green. Um, looking at the national park. Everything in a green too, showing winds coming in from the northeast at six miles an hour, and blows a plume further away, especially with very little gas coming out. So coming up here to the charts, looking at the last 24, 48 hours, everything in a green that's reporting in data, showing no issues in the last couple of days. Still, it is possible if you're going to the national park. We try to catch a view of the changing landscape. Just if an eruption does begin, you're gonna, gonna check it out, then certainly follow park signage and recommendations up there. Especially if you have um, respiratory predispositions as well. So that is the gas, and that's all for the gas. I think with that, we'll switch over to Mauna Loa, which will be pretty quick as well, but <laughs> let's do it. Mauna Loa's update from the USGS today, our first uh, first of the month update, first Thursday of the month update. Um, while alive, no activity, few earthquakes on par with previous months. Mauna Loa, no significant activity. Number of earthquakes is a background level, as most events smaller in magnitude 2. Data from GPS instruments in Mauna Loa indicates slow inflation as magma replenishes the summit reservoir system. Gas and temperature data from a station showed no significant changes, and Nothing else to report on Mauna Loa. So that's really the story of Mauna Loa. While we're here, we just note that they also are tracking other volcanoes. Haleakala, no activity. Mauna Kea, no activity. Kamaehua Kanaloa, no activity. And over in Samoa, Ta'u and Ofuolosega also no activity in case you're still 
tracking and wondering about that. So if we look at Mauna Loa, there is a last month summit tilt. You see the tilt was rising and it seems to have cycled down. So there's some small short term change. Um, not nothing very major, but just like when we were saying the magma was coming in and this pattern of, of filling is normal, um, having little variations where it dip, wiggles and dips down is also normal. So it's likely some short term um, adjustment happening there. We know that Kilauea off the side of Mauna Loa is moving and adjusting. So if Kilauea moves out of the way enough or pushes back on Mauna Loa enough, it might actually help pinch Mauna Loa back together a little bit, pressurize it or change its conditions, right? That might lead it to maybe not be able to inflate quite so easily temporarily before it maybe resumes again. We'll have to wait and see what the pattern actually is, but the timing here, um, given that, that Kilauea is so pressurized, may, may uh, be associated, but we don't have any hard evidence of that necessarily. We're just talking through what might be visible on the graph here. For the last month, earthquakes per day, um, the most was nine. For the last week, the most was six. So really not a whole lot happening earthquake-wise. And to really see that in perspective, here's the last year. There we are at the low end, really low earthquakes compared to build up to the last eruption in 2022. Or for the last five years, five years of build up of the eruption, all of this stuff, we're at lower levels today than any time in the last five years still. So that's Mauna Loa's earthquakes. There's a map of where they are in the summit. Lots of small events, kind of on the south flank. It's kind of a similar, pat similar pattern to Kilauea. Um, I th what I think is interesting is if I, let's see if I, uh, do I have the monthly from Mauna Loa on here or the year? No, let's see, I'm gonna click through on here and see if I can see the USGS page without it crashing on me. Let me get this to where it shows the last year. show you guys so here's the last year of Mauna Loa and just for comparison right there is a summit caldera with all of its activity and lineation and there is that spot to the northwest that's showing that doors stop waking as well so pretty similar to Kilauea happening right now let's that pull that up here real quick just to make the comparison but that's not what's happening right now on Mauna Loa right just to pull it back Mauna Loa is right now looking like this very quiet so that is most of our volcano content this week. We're going to cover Volcano Watch as well. Volcano Watch from the USGS this week is actually focused on INSAR time series in Alaska. So we won't talk about the Alaskan volcanoes that much. Um, but there's basically noting that INSAR is really useful, especially if you don't have instruments on the ground um, in remote areas like this in Alaska. And so that's mostly what the study is about, how they were able to, to detect um, the volcano was actually uh, showing activity for the first time in history. Um, it's it just something that, that maybe hundreds, eight, 900 years ago might have erupted, erupted previously when the indigenous people have oral traditional records of it, but nothing really more recent than that. Um, and they were able to retroactively by using the satellite to detect that, that there was uh, several years of no change and then several years of it actually starting to inflate um, as visible from the NSR. So that's pretty cool. What I took from this was, I thought was more interesting. Maybe I'll just mention it real quick here that, you know, I should have been a little bit earlier. This, the, the um, volcano where this occurred is Mount Edgecombe on Khrushchev Island near the town of Sitka, Alaska. Right. And Edgecombe is actually famous for something else, which was an elaborate April Fool's Day prank in 1974. Um, geologic record showing it's quiet for 4,000 years, oral tradition 800, 900 years ago, and otherwise April Fool's prank in 1974. So only because I hadn't heard of this, I thought I'd look into it a little bit more, and now we're on hoaxes.org. This is from the Museum of Hoaxes out of San Diego. They have a, a, a whole archive for April Fool's jokes, and I just thought this is their number three all-time. show you guys here, this is an image of that volcano in its prank state of eruption, April 1st, 1974, right there. And so there it is. You see it's calm of black smoke coming up there. And if you didn't know what was going on, you probably would have been pretty, pretty worried there. Right, but actually the story is interesting. This was the, the, the brainchild of a prankster known as Oliver, quote, Porky Bicar. I don't know if it's Bicar or Bicker, um, but 
long story short, uh, he'd been waiting for years for a clear April Fool's Day where you could see the volcano from Sitka. That happened in 1974. He'd been stashing tires in his airport hangar for all those years, just waiting for the right moment. So he calls up some helicopter pilots. They fly these tires up into the crater, bring some smoke, smoke bombs, some kerosene, light the whole thing on fire, trudge through the snow and write in giant spray paint letters, April Fools, in the snow. Um, so that later when a Coast Guard comes flying over, they actually note, oh, by the way, April Fools joke, yeah, don't, don't need to... Um, you can cancel the alert that you pass up to your higher, higher ups in command. Coast Guard got left out of the loop. Um, it turns out that Mr. Bakar was actually on a police commission. He called the police, called the fire department, called all, all, all the officials in town so that no one would, would create a false sense of panic there. He missed the Coast Guard, though, so that, that's, that's how that came to be there. And yeah, pretty interesting. 1974, the eruption, that never was. Right? And it's, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, a million reasons why this wouldn't happen today. Right? But, um, right. You would be arrested. And so the <laughs> FAA was joking about it with the guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. EPA would come and find you. Yeah, you'd be arrested. Oh, yeah. Yeah. FAA, yeah, yeah, yeah. FAA gave you clearance. Straight to jail. Yeah, they had FAA clearance. It was like a legal flight and everything. Like, you know, everything was registered. He paid for it. Right? Um, yeah. yeah. Never was fined or anything else. So there he is, Porky Bikar, right? With his famous hard hats that he would crush by filling the spar tree at the Alaska logging conventions that used to be there back in the day. Anyways, that's enough of an aside here, but that's where that, that yep. thread led from the fake eruption of Mount Edgecombe in 1974. So, since we're off the rails, let's get back on here a little bit and finish it off here. Um, I thought what we could do is uh, wrap into our community segment this week a little bit of our images, because the images are not of anything actually um, um, volcanic as much, right? Um, here are the photo, photo chronology from Kilauea Mauna Loa today. Consists of, let me just give us a refresh just in case. Consists of a picture from this last week of the Vibrosize truck, part of the Kilauea Seismic Imaging Project, which is just completing here on Kilauea. There it is. You can see the tire is slightly off the ground, the pad on the ground, it's vibrating in the ground, and that's being picked up by all those 2,000 nodes that are deployed all across the volcano. And so uh, according to the schedule, the, the truck has stopped driving around and are not collecting nodes, um, but this was just finishing up here last week. So here's a different different image of the Vibro size. This is down on Gila Nepali Road. There's a small fault scarp. This is part of that Kauai fault system where that, that 2.9 inch point out in the map occurs, right? Like that kind of zone that connects the southeast rift and the southwest rift goes right, right next to this road by Kauai. This fault actually moves. It's a um, um, really interesting geological area right here. So there's a the truck, USGS guy. This is like a one-lane road. They're basically blocking traffic here and um, yeah, that's the Vibra size truck. That was on Kilauea. The field campaign for USGS continues. Here they are also on Mauna Loa this past week up at the summit. Here's a summit cabin on Mauna Loa. There they are finding a benchmark, deploying a GPS station above it where they let it sit and average over time. And then they collect the data, take it back down and compare it to every year, right? Some of these places are not places you could really have instrumentation permanently year round. You don't have that as many places as you would like, right? So there are these annual surveys that occur as we'll, where they'll go out and position these instruments over benchmarks, collect data for some shorter period of time, but do it uh, ideally yearly or more often if you need to. And so, especially considering the eruption of Mauna Loa last year, imagine how important all this, all this data is going to be to compare to before. So there's one up by, up by the summit cabin. Here's another. This appears to me to be closer to the southwest Sorry, northwest part of part of the caldera. Um, see the photograph here in the background. I wonder if this is the back of that 1949 cone. It's hard hard for me to tell from this angle exactly. There's a helicopter. Um, one clear spot in the middle of that a, a field where they where they are landed. And yeah, that's part of the USGS field campaign, right? They're using helicopters to help them, help them get around and save time. You can get here if you were to drive with the USGS, but it, it's a whole all day trip to maybe get like one data point. So if you, if you can go and deploy your, all your instruments around at the same time and then kind of 
let your time pass and come back and scoop and collect them all afterwards, then you basically are more efficient that way. So maybe that's what's going on. So and the reason I want to put this in our community section, because from there, we can actually go into looking at what these projects are doing right now. Here's a Viber size page. They do know on our page that the last dates of driving in Viber size were was yesterday. Uh, officially, who knows if there are delays, if they're still going today or not, but officially they were done yesterday with Fritterum Drive, um, Old Volcano Road, and Volcano Village area through there. And here we are in early June, and what they're saying is a temporary seismic nose will be retrieved from Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. So it took them a while, a while to put all of these out, right? There's close to 2,000 of them, so it'll probably be a while for them to collect them back up again too, and then you know, take them all somewhere to download the data and all of that. So that's wrapping up, but there you might be able to see USGS personnel in orange vests walking across the entire volcano, down in the caldera, elsewhere as well, collecting these things over the next next uh, few weeks here. So that's the first set of those images. The second set of set of images, the helicopters. Uh, the National Park has put out a notice of flight operations for June, which is something that they normally do. We don't really spend much time on, but this month they are noting some USGS activity. So besides their other uh, park park work, which they're doing for fence replacement along Kapapala Ranch and Boundary at 4,000 feet on June 21st, and uh, Wa'u Petrol Monitoring in Mauna Loa on June 29th. The USGS is additionally conducting several lo so several low-level helicopter flights in June. Starting tomorrow between 7 a.m. and noon, multiple flights are planned by the USGS HVO to study rock exposures within Hale Ma'u Ma'u, collect data from GPS stations on Kilauea Caldera floor, and to survey GPS benchmarks in Mauna Loa between 5,000 and 12,700 foot elevations. So more of the same, right? They're uh, continuing to collect the seismic, the seismic nodes. They're flying back into Hale Ma'u Ma'u. Maybe they're collecting more of those ash samples if they, if they have beds to target, and they're continuing GPS downhill from the summit of Mauna Loa as well. And continuing June 8th, between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m., multiple flights to retrieve temporary seismic instruments in areas west of the caldera and south of Kalina Pali Road. So once again, seismic node retrieval, just like they had a deployment back uh, a few months ago. Additional flights may occur, especially if there's some kind of eruption that's not planned on the books here. And that is the helicopter flight update. And they do note that management of the park requires use of aircraft to monitor and research activity, conduct search and rescue missions and law enforcement operations, support management of resources and maintain facilities. And as we mentioned last week, there still is open public input period for the air tour management that's going to be open through June 20th. So just to mention that's still open, you can go to the National Park website and find it if you would like to comment on that. All right, community. We mentioned this earlier at the start of our program. Coming up on Tuesday, we have our next live stream at 4 p.m., a little bit different time, 4 p.m. time on Tuesday, uh, in collaboration with Pohaku Pelemaka, Kealoha Estate, uh, Pohoiki. We have heard the rumblings of some good news. We're awaiting confirmation of that, so we hope that there will be some positive discussion. Really, fingers crossed on that. And Join us on Tuesday. Yeah, to maybe we can announce. Yeah. Hear, yeah, hear more. That's Tuesday. Also on Tuesday evening in a national park, After Dark in a Park series uh, in June, begins on Tuesday, June 6th, 7 p.m., The Battle of Midway, a Japanese perspective given by Ben Hayes, interpretive uh, ranger at the national park. Right? And historian as well. So right. that's it for the next week. Um, there are other events in the park, like Ulana Lauhala, um, Saving Vahipana, over at Kahuku, um, some concerts. Um, the next one um, that's volcanic would be June 20th, Tuesday, June 20th, 7 p.m., Wikuhuna, Thomas Dragon Museum, and Hawaiian Book Observatory. It's actually an archaeology talk on the site of Wikuhuna and how the, how the HVO was built. So this is kind of a story that fits together with what's going to happen next with this whole movement and reconstruction of the park. So that's enough, uh, enough going out in June. However, the National Park has one more date they've put out. Save the date for the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park Hawaiian Cultural Festival, July 22nd. This will be at Kahuku on Mauna Loa's Southwest Rift, um, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. They have lots of these uh, crafts. 
This is also a great place to go in and look at the 1868 Fisher, which is right near that uh, festival grounds there. They have some short trails to go through there. Awesome lava trees, stories of people getting trapped between rivers of lava, wrote, wrote, wrote in their, in their uh, journals and diaries back then. Um, there is a runway that we know that uh, another favorite, favorite geologist of ours, Jack Lockwood, used to take off on his fabric wing airplane to fly over the eruptions of Mauna Loa and actually came back with holes in his. There's all kinds of cool stuff over there at Kahuku. So um, not just a cultural festival, but it's definitely an area worth checking out volcanically and historically as well. And if this is the one time a year to give you extra incentive to go, then mark the date July 22nd, 2023. So that wraps up our community corner. Um, we do have thank yous as usual, um, but I will pass it over to Dane. To yeah. Yes, for this. Make sure. Yeah, I uh, appreciate everybody that tuned in today. You know, we rely on viewers like you to help get this uh, content out there. The like, share, subscriptions, all that stuff really does help with the algorithm. I know all the channels talk about all that stuff, but it really does help. Uh, helps the channel get out there, get more exposure and all that kind of stuff without having to pay for it. Uh, we also like to thank County of Hawaii for uh, help funding this kind of content through the Bye Bye Grant program. Uh, we appreciate that and being able to do the written uh, content that we do, the videos as well as these live videos. So really appreciate that one. Um, and it, just throw this out there. If anybody does want to make donations, we do take those on ytracker.com uh, slash support as well as the YouTube Super Chats. There was two Super Chats I wanted to acknowledge. Uh, long time uh, supporters. First was Gary Bryan with $35 Super Chat. It says, uh, thanks Phil and Dane for these updates. Second one was uh, I get Ed with a $20 uh, Super Chat, but that was on the stream that crashed. They, they we did some weird stuff. We ended up having two streams on YouTube, essentially. Mm. One picked up, one the other one stopped. Anyways, it was on that one. Um, so appreciate that one. And all the support as well for the people that came back to the second stream after we crashed. I know that we lost a bunch of viewers at that point, but, you know, technical difficulties happen. And, you know, we try. All right. I think that gets us through the thank yous there. Appreciate that support there. Really do appreciate that, uh, you guys. And, yeah, we will be back, you know, unless something happens, you know, if uh, it decides to... Bailey pops her head out, then we will try and go live and cover that. We'll see how uh, available that's going to be. We might end up having to do it the old school style, you know, if we're doing something in a meeting or something like that and bust out the tablet and point the cell phone at the tablet and walk you through it that way, you know, just like in 2018. But all right, unless uh, that happens, we will see you Tuesday. Yeah, sounds good. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, we'll, we'll be on standby as usual for you guys and Regardless, we expect activity to happen at the summit and not nothing on a rift zone. Just to just to restate that. Right. Go ahead, Dane. There was one question. If you want to do that real quick. Yeah. Uh, Kenny asked. It, um, so with the steady inflation, when she does pop, is it going to be a lot a lot of lava? Like as in, it's been a cumulative process or a building process, and then that's all going to be let out when it does go. Yeah, I mean, what we do see is a, is a pattern of eruptions usually begin with a really high effusion, and then it kind of tails off for a while, right? So we saw back in the first time it, this began, December 2020, the amount of lava that came out at first, like it filled the, filled the crater, I want to say it was like 400 feet in the first 12 hours or something, 24 hours. It was, it was quite a lot. And then mm -hmm. it kind of slowed down afterwards. I mean, it's true, true it was skinnier at the time as well. Then it kind of tailed off for the next four months or so, right? Five months or so, right? Um, then when it began in September, it burst with a, you know, kind of a, a big startup as well, September 2021, and that lasted all the way until November, December 2022, in that case. And it kind of started off really strong, and then it was able to sustain a, a, a lower rate for quite a long time, right? And what's really interesting to me is, in comparison to those two, the January 2023 eruption um, only lasted two months, the one we just had. Um, but it was only stopped for a month, really, right? It was only stopped from December to January. So think, think about it that way. It was only stopped for a month in that case. So, you know, um, if it builds up pressure for a month, it was able to release it for about two, we'll call it, right? And it mm -hmm. began with a big burst that sent out those big waves of lava. I mean, we, we talked about them being like tsunami waves coming across the floor of the crater there. 
So it started off really, really intense, and then it basically peered off pretty quick after that, right? So they always start with a big bang, is what I'm trying to get at. And depending on how long it builds up, that, that initial phase could last longer, and overall the whole eruption could last longer as well. And that's kind of where, where I would take it as, as a proposition, right? Um, just based on what we've seen here recently. A good question, Kenny. Um, hard to know exactly what's going to happen, right? If it just pops from a kind of a slow build up, then maybe that's something what, 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 how it goes. But there's always an X factor. Let's say, say some big batch of magma comes in from below from this whole hotspot system and it comes into this system that's already all the way stressed. Now anything goes. And you could have some giant outburst or, you know, two different areas of who knows of fissures who knows um what could happen at that point in time we're really at a point where it's it's we're the seesaw is kind of balanced and it can really go in any, any direction now but yeah good 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 discussion to be had there for sure yeah definitely all right well i think that does it for the questions not seeing any more in the chat um you know, we will be back next week on Tuesday, new time for that special 4 p.m. presentation on Poe. And I think that'll do it for me. All right, Dane, that's enough for me, too. We'll, we'll just <laughs> talk to you guys a lot a couple of days ago, and we may be back sooner than we think. So we'll Always see you chance. when it happens, or we'll yep. see you on Tuesday otherwise. Well, hello, everybody, for your support. Thanks for tuning in. I apologize for the technical, issue, technical issues once again. And until next week, from HawaiiTracker.com, he's Dane DuPont. I'm Philip Ong. Hello, everybody.